those of you who are new here, welcome. My name is Leslie. I'm one of the elders here at the Mount Christian Fellowship. I think I'm an elder by virtue of my age and my hair. Try to keep up with it in terms of wisdom, but it's always a struggle. We're happy to have you with us. And just to give you a brief uh, run-up, we have been on this series on the distinctives of our faith and looking at the different aspects of just what does salvation mean? Because we just have this umbrella term salvation and it means to most people, okay, I've given my heart to Jesus and I have a relationship with God and I say, well, <coughs> all of those are absolutely true. But there are, there's more detail to it, if you like. Right? It's like you see a painting from far away and it looks okay. You have an idea of what it is. But then you get up close and you start to look at the finer strokes and, and, and you see the balance of the colors and so forth. And that's what we're trying to do with this series on salvation. So we've looked at the different aspects of salvation. What does redemption mean? What does justification mean? And today we are going to look at Adoption. Now, again, this is not something <clears throat> that often we, we hear in sermons, adoption. But I believe it has very significant implication on our relationship with God. And as I looked at this in greater detail, I realized that so many Christians um, don't have the joy of the Lord in their walk. They carry a large burden, possibly because they haven't really grasped this concept of what it means to be adopted by the living God. What does adoption mean? So that's where we're going today. Join me in a word of prayer and we'll get right into this. Lord Jesus, you came to live amongst us to reveal the Father. And it's wonderful that you revealed him as Father, not just as Creator, as Lord, as King, but primarily as Father. And we thank you that you decided before the creation of the world that you would make us in your image, you would adopt us so that we can receive the full inheritance of your love and glory. So we give you thanks. Open our hearts and our minds as we come to your living word this morning. Convict us of what is true and of what will bear fruit in our lives. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have the verses here. Uh, but by all means, refer in, in your Bibles or on your phones. And I put it in the line message for you to read Romans chapter 8. I, I think it's one of the most wonderful uh, chapters in Scripture. Uh, there was a time I could recite the whole of Romans chapter 8. I think I could still do good parts of it, but if you ever had to memorize something in Scripture, go memorize Romans chapter 8. Okay? But here we are in verse 14, and what does it say? For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption. This is why, this is what the Spirit has done. It has brought about our adoption to sonship. And by Him, we cry, Abba. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. Remember when, when I started this series on justification? I said that the purpose of justification and adoption and all of these things is what? 
glorification. Okay? That is where we are going with this. God made us in his image so that we might be able to share in his glory. And that is what we look forward to. That is the purpose of all of this, that we, like Christ, may be glorified. What a wonderful revelation. Now, although here the terms are used in the masculine, let me just point out that that was a, a, a cultural practice when Paul was writing in, in, in his day and age, but the theology and the concept of adoption is for both men and women. And, and we talk about sonship, we can talk about being children of God. Right? So we are brothers and sisters in Christ, or sisters and brothers. There's no value or merit to the order in which that is said. So the word adoption <coughs> is what we would call an action noun. Because it acts like a verb. The Holy Spirit performs the act of adopting. I would like to point out that in Roman law, when Paul was writing to the Romans, they understood in Roman law, an adopted child had the exact same position and privileges as a natural born child. It wasn't a second class of child. You with me? It was the same. Under the law, once you adopted someone, they had all the rights and privileges of your birth children, if you have it. Okay? So, this adopted child then would have legal standing and would have the right to inheritance. That is what adoption meant to the Romans. Now, had a legal right to use the family name. And with that came all the rights to the property, to the authority, to the inheritance. So the simple point was there was no distinction between the birth child and the adopted child. And that's very important for you to hold on to. Now this morning I'd like to show what spiritual adoption is and what a great privilege it is. Like I said, it's not something we talk about or have maybe heard too many sermons on, but it's a very important concept. But the concept of adoption is very significant because it is almost the difference between just being the citizen of a country as compared to being a child of the king. Now just imagine, for, for the one of a better example, you wanted to migrate to the United Kingdom and you applied to be a citizen of the United Kingdom. But what if somewhere in that application process you suddenly receive a letter and, and the letter says, Queen Elizabeth has become aware of your application. And she is now prepared to confer upon you the rights to be in the royal family. You can take on the name Windsor and you become part of the royal family. And you have a right to the throne if, if the line works out or whatever. Okay, let's not get into it. It's, it's, it's a trivial analogy. But just imagine, you, you apply to be a citizen of the country and suddenly the king or the queen steps up and says, I'll make you my child and co-heir with the prince. Now, now are we getting the scale of what this means? We are not just one of the many of the kingdom of God. You become a son. You become a daughter. Of God Himself, the Father. That is so amazing. Now, I believe it's this inadequate understanding of adoption that robs us of our earthly inheritance. What earthly inheritance? The inheritance of joy and a loving relationship with God. 
Because there are many Christians, and I'll come back to this at the end of our message, but I believe our reflection, there are many Christians who don't feel worthy of the grace that has been extended to us. And we misunderstand when Paul says you have to work out your salvation, and we think somehow we have to keep maintaining or earning or increasing the value of salvation. The concept of adoption then clearly does away with all of this because the moment you are adopted, you have all the rights. You don't have to do anything more in order to keep that status. You understand? It's not something earned. It's not a result of effort or goodness. It is something bestowed. It is a gift. And you receive all of that. So I don't have to feel like, oh, this week I haven't really been good. I haven't been reading my Bible. I haven't been praying enough. I haven't been nice to a few people. So this week I feel like I can't really approach God. And if you add that up, and it goes on for week after week, and suddenly we feel we have backslidden. I don't really like the concept. Because where can we go from God? Can we backslide so far away that we can't reach God? That I don't think that's an accurate concept. We can feel separated from Him, but He is never separated from us. And that is very important for you to understand. So that whenever you want to turn to Him, He's right there. And the wonderful thing, that the, the picture that I love about adoption is because he's my father, I can climb into his lap anytime I like. I don't have to seek an audience. He's given me the right. He says, call me. Abba. Now, which of you, we have so many of us here are parents, which of you tell your, your child, okay, if you want to talk to me, make an appointment. And there are certain days I don't want to talk to you. At certain times I'm too busy, I'm not interested. Even you or even we who are evil know how to give good gifts to our children. How much more so our Father who is in heaven. Do you ever feel like you've got to refuse the embrace, the invitation for embrace from your child? I can't think of a time my girls have run up to me with open arms and I said, ah, I don't really want to hurt you. I've always planned that they want an embrace, right? And no matter what they've done, no matter what the situation is, if they come screaming, Daddy, Daddy, I'm Daddy. How do we know how to do this? Because we have been made in the image of God and we instinctively understand what it is to be parents. We can't even explain it. I was looking at one of these uh, chat groups and, and one of these uh, young ladies I know just gave birth. And she reflected. She said, it's amazing. 30 minutes after delivery, this child was put in my arms. The child hasn't done anything to deserve my love. But the moment I held my child, every instinct for love was already there. In that one moment, I knew without a doubt I would sacrifice my life for this child. What a beautiful reflection, don't you think? That all of us who are parents, we get it, don't we? We understand immediately when you hold your child and you're able to say, yes. All of the love that is required is already given. This child doesn't have to be good, be smart, be talented, whatever. It doesn't matter. I will love this child regardless. And that's what adoption means. In fact, J.L. Packer um, explains the importance of the truth of adoption and what it means. Let me just read this quotation because it's kind of long. He said, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. 
If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. For everything that Christ has taught, everything that makes the New Testament new and better than the old, everything that is distinctly, distinctively Christian as opposed to Jewish, is summed up by the knowledge of the fatherhood of God. And I love this phrase, Father is the Christian name for God. I've got a whole lot of slides up this morning. I think uh, what I will do is put that on our line. Okay, or well, somehow Stan will work out how to put these slides together with the uh, recording when you put it up, right? Or it will show up on the recording, won't it? Yeah, okay. So, so don't panic too much, but if you want, you can use your phones and take photos of these quotations and so forth. So, Father is the Christian name for God. And this is very important if we just take a moment to understand the difference between the Old Testament understanding of God and what Paul was bringing to the people. Okay? Now, in the Old Testament, who was God? He was the creator of the universe. <clears throat> he was Lord and King. But God was someone whom you couldn't really approach. You've got to get this understanding, right? When he was there on Sinai, only Moses could go up and meet with him. Yes? And there was a boundary. There was literally a line, a do not cross line. And, and that line says, if you, if you cross over that line, you will die. It's like an electric fence. Electric holiness. You couldn't get close to God because you were tainted. And then you picture that once a year, the greatest celebration was when they would come to Jerusalem, celebrate the Passover, and what would happen there? They would have this uh, Psalm 133, uh, they, they, they have this big celebration. Remember, behold how good and pleasant it is with brothers dwell in unity. And they would have all these rituals and they would pour the oil upon the high priest of Aaron flowing down upon his robes and the corner of his robes. And then he would go into the Holy of Holies. And even then he had bells on the bottom of his robes so they could hear him. So God was this really mighty, awesome, almost fearful person. You understand? He was within the veil. You couldn't get to God. You yourself could not get to God. You needed all the offerings, the sacrifice, and the priests, and the high priest to mediate on your behalf. So there were many, many barriers between you and God. And that's what Jesus came to renew and fulfill. This was God's purpose. God's purpose was never to be distant. God's heart was always to embrace. But this is the nature of the story. There had to be law. And then he would show and reveal that the law he could never fulfill. But it will be grace and love that would save us. So this is the contrast, this distant God in, in, behind the Holy of Holies, behind the veil. You would never see the Ark of the Covenant, okay? And he would be up there. You would see in the distance, imagine this, this mountain up there, and there's a cloud, and there's lightning, and there's, there's all kinds of amazing things happening, but you are far away. You are nowhere near. So suddenly Jesus says, I have come to reveal the Father. This is a mind-blowing concept. If you were a Jew in Jesus' day. And he says, not only is he your father or distant father, he is close, personal. And you may now call him Abba. You've got to realize the contrast there as well. Before that, the name of God was a name that was not pronounceable. 
because you had no right to even say the name of God, right? So it was just consonants. Y H W H. No vowels because you're not supposed to speak the name of God. You can use substitutes. You can call him Elohim. You can call him El Shaddai. But you cannot use the Y H W H because it is so holy, so sacred. Imagine that. You can't even say the name of God. And then now Jesus comes and he says, you can use the most personal, affectionate name that everybody who, who has a loving father, they call him Abba. This is now your creator. And why is that possible? Because he has adopted you. So adoption is the embracing of the child of another to be one's own child, so that the adopted child has the same position and all the advantages of a child by birth. Now, this was a Greek and Roman concept, not a Jewish one. Jews were big on the bloodline. In fact, you're a Jew because of your mother, and you have to trace your mother's line. All right? So, this concept of adoption was a Greek and Roman one. And Paul used this to explain the new covenant relationship that we get adopted by God. We are joined to God's family through adoption by both rebirth and adoption. Rebirth, right? We say, John says what? Unless a man be born again. You have to be born again, baptized and be born again. So there is a rebirth. We know that that is a spiritual rebirth. And I think the spiritual rebirth emphasizes the likeness aspect. We, we are children of the Heavenly Father. As uh, Second Peter it says, partakers of the divine nature. I am rebirth when we say, I believe. That Christ has died for me, and, and I want to be born again. We, we, our sin DNA, our spiritual sin DNA, is changed for Christ DNA. So we have been given the capacity, the desire not to sin anymore. But unfortunately, our physical DNA, our psychological DNA, still remains, and that. Therein lies the struggle, right? But adoption identifies our legal standing, our position or status, our privilege and inheritance as adult children. Adoption implies a birth parent. You with me? Adoption implies there was a birth parent. Everybody has had to have birth parent except Adam and Eve. But other than that, you have a birth parent. So if you are adopted, the, your new parents or your new father is not your birth father. Okay? Now, Jesus Christ redeemed us from a hostile, condemning parent, that is the sin of Adam and, and Lucifer, so that we might enjoy the blessing of a life of grace through Jesus Christ in God's loving family. I'm going to go through this quickly. We have five points of what adoption is all about. Now, what is the meaning of adoption? Paul does not use an unfamiliar or complicated term. In fact, he's the only one who uses it. Um, and that is huyotesia. Huyotesia. From huyos, which means a son, and Thesia, which is the root for thesis, and it means a placing. So you write a thesis, you're placing a concept. You are defending a position. Okay? So adoption, the word adoption in the Greek is thesia, the placing of a son. It signifies the place and condition of a son given to one who does not naturally belong. This is something that is bestowed. It was not a birthright. It is a bestowed right. 
Now, as I have said already, the enrollment law and adopted child has the exact same position and privileges as a natural born child in terms of legal standing, in terms of inheritance. Who here is old enough to have seen the movie Ben Hur? Oh, not too bad. Go, I don't know, is it available on YouTube or Netflix or something? It, it's a classic movie. But in a nutshell, if you haven't seen the movie, it is the story uh, of a Jew who was captured and thrown into slavery, and he was uh, in, in the galleys rowing uh, in this, the, the Roman fleet. And the commander of the Roman fleet in the battle was thrown overboard, and they lost the battle. But this person, Ben Hur, jumps overboard and saves him. Okay? And because he saves him, when they are rescued, this Roman commander um, adopts him and gives him this ring. In the movie, you'll see he gets this ring. And he then, because this Roman commander had no family, so suddenly uh, Judah then her becomes the son of this Roman commander, and he has all of this inheritance and wealth before him. So that is the concept. Then, okay? Now, what is the reason for adoption? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. As for you, you were dead. Your transgressions are uh, dead in your transgressions and sin. Verse 2. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And then... Uh, I think that's a mistake there. Oh, sorry. Move on. No, it's the next page. Okay. Wait. I, I we left out the verse. Galatians chapter four. If if you're interested to read it, interested to read it. Galatians chapter four, uh, verse four and five. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. So that is the, re the reason for adoption, because we would be dead in our transgressions. We would be lost and condemned because of our sinfulness. But God, out of his love, decided to change that storyline and we have his own son born of a virgin. That's a DNA issue. Born without sin. Or the need to sin. And so that he might pay the price for our sin. What is the privilege of adoption? Two primary, primary privileges. Firstly, it gives us a new standing with God. In our sin, we can't really stand in the presence of God. Our sinfulness would destroy us. Just like the people couldn't cross that line in, in Mount Sinai. Right? But Galatians chapter 4, it says, Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So as I used the analogy before, he's no longer distant on the top of a mountain or behind a veil in the temple. But now we have been given the right to climb into his lap. And that's one of my favorite things to do. It will tell you I love to go out, either climb in my boat, or go for a walk, or just sit in a quiet place. And I feel in those moments I'm just climbing into God's lap. And I'm leaning up against his chest and I'm hearing his heartbeat. And it's such a wonderful, loving rhythm. And it comforts me. And when I'm sitting there in God's lap and I feel his breath upon me, I know 
all will be well. Be still, my troubled soul, for it will be well. <clears throat> and all of these assurances come. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Not life, not death, not the present, not the future, nor heights, nor depth, nothing in all creation can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus because I have been adopted and I am his child. It's us a standing with God, a right to climb into his step. Secondly, it gives us a new nature. I remember having a baptism by a charismatic pastor, and he spoke from mm -hmm. Romans 8, and he says, you are crucified with Christ. When you rise up, you will feel completely new. The old Leslie will be dead. There will be a new Leslie. And I was so excited. How oh, wonderful. I remember him cupping my nose and holding my mouth and pushing me under. And I said, goodbye, Leslie. And he raised me up. And my first thought was, oh, I still feel the same. <laughs> same old crappy Leslie is still there. But over the years, and this is uh, this, uh, 50 years ago or something, um, I realized that it was a spiritual transformation, not a physical one. If I look back on reflection, I realize that so much of my life was new. If, if I had an instinct to do something bad, to hurt someone, there would be a check now. And, and there would be a little voice saying, don't do that. That's not a good thing to do. And my mind would be, Slowly, I can't tell you a point. I, I can't tell you that moment when everything changed. It wasn't. It was a process. But if I reflect now, I realize that my instincts have become me. So when I look at the world, I'm thinking not of what I can exploit, as much of where I can help, where I can give, where I can contribute. When someone does something hurtful, I don't think of how I can gain revenge or hurt them back or make them suffer. I realize something in my spirit has, is prompting me to pray for them, to forgive them, to, to love them. Right? So this is the new nature that we receive. Uh, and there is a longing to please God. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. That was the verse that Pastor uh, was uh, declaring just before he shot me underwater. But I've already explained how my lack of understanding at the time did not give me an accurate perspective of what God really was doing. And I did in that immersion, receive a new spirit. And the old had, in many senses, passed. Uh, I don't have this, but um, the second Keaton, I think this goes to the fourth one already. Okay? But I'll read this. Second Peter, chapter one. And verse 3, if you're wanting to take notes like Miles. And Peter says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Think about that. That's a powerful verse. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. 
I believe this to be true. That there is a different capacity that we have to deal with temptation and corruption. Because we hold before ourselves the example of Christ. And the, the power, the temptation of, of the ways of the world is no, are no longer uh, that insurmountable. I think we still have to work at it. I don't think we can ever take it for granted that, oh, I can no longer sin. I am no longer tempted. No, I have to be careful. And I have to be wise. I don't put myself in the way of temptation. Right? So we, we focus, we spend on time. We spend time physically in places that edify us. We, we volunteer in church. We get involved in small groups. We, we, we do charitable things. Uh, we have healthy, wholesome sports and we have good friends. So we avoid that those temptations and the ways of the world, right? Now, the process of adoption, what happens? It is a right given by the Holy Spirit. Notice the word received in both these passages. In Romans chapter 8, 15, it says, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. But you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Now, I just want to have a very quick time out. For some people, this is very important. You did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. The point I want to make is I realize there's a lot of Christian theology out there that is premised on fear. You should study your Bible. If not, God will not be pleased with you. You should tithe to this church and this organization because it's doing God's work. And if you don't, then it's no wonder that God doesn't bless you. Have you come across this kind of theology? Be wary. Wave a red flag when something brings about fear. You say, what about the fear of the Lord? I think the fear of the Lord to me is a respectful, reverent fear. It's not a cowering fear. It's not a, oh no, God finds out I'm in trouble. Oh no, he's going to give me cancer. Oh no, he's going to punish me. Something bad's going to happen to my children. That is not the way that God wants us to live. That is not the reason Christ died on the cross for you so that you might live this earthly life in fear of what may come. I can't say that forcefully or clearly enough. He has not given us the spirit so that we might be slaves to fear again. Christ died. What did he say? I have come that you might have life. What is that life if it's lived in fear? What is that life? No, I have come that you might have life and have it in all of its abundance. And I'm not talking about material abundance. I'm talking about an abundance of joy. There are many wealthy people who have an abundance of material possessions who live in fear of who's going to take away, who's going to try and cheat them, who's going to exploit them, who's out to sue them. That is not abundance. He has come that we have, might have an abundance of faith. That nothing will ever separate us from the love of God. He has come that we might have an abundance of joy. My cup overflows. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Yes, that's why he came. Not to give us a spirit of fear. So, if you are living in that place, in that little Christian bubble where 
I am afraid. I haven't done my Bible study. I haven't volunteered enough. I don't tithe enough. I don't think enough good thoughts. Burst that bubble because Christ has come to set you free. Don't sit there anymore. We undermine and we reject the love of God when we live in that space. You see what I'm saying? It pains me. It pains me when I think of all that can be yours and this incorrect theology or the wrong voices that have spoken into your life have just brought you into a place of fear and inadequacy. Today, let the authority of the adoption of the God the Father dispel all of that. Amen. Be set free in the name of Jesus and tell yourself, I am a child of God. There is that song, right? I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Hallelujah. Be set free to live in the joy of the family of God. John chapter 1 verse 12. Yeah. To all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Right refers to a legal right. Your identity card has been changed. You know, imagine if you're born to a family that has a really bad name. I don't want to pull out any names, but you, you, you can think of some families that have a bad name because of their history. And imagine if you're actually quite a decent person, but you carry this family name. But someone comes along and says, no, you don't have to live with these chains of your family name and history. I'll change your identity card. You have a new identity. And you have been set free from this historical curse of your family. So, that is what happens in the process of adoption. Now, I, I brought this book. Um, it's, it's part of my family history, from Fujian to Penang and beyond. And this, my grandfather was the oldest of 16 children. 16 from one mother. They didn't have television in those days, I always say. But 16 children. And this is the compilation of the family history. I, I remember this this morning. It was too late to get it up on screen. But there is a color picture here. And in the front row are all the daughters. The, the daughters of, of this uh, uh, venerable great-grandfather. Okay? But here you'll see there's an Indian lady. I want to share this sensitively. This is not racially intended or colored in any way. But this is a Chinese family in Penang decades ago. And there's an Indian lady sitting there in position with the daughters. She's not hiding somewhere behind. She's in the front row. Now, what is the story behind this? She had a young son, and the father ran away. And she was outside the family home or on the family street begging. Our great-grandfather took her in. The son couldn't go to school because he had no name. He had no birth certificate. His father had run away. The father needs to register the birth certificate. The mother can't do it. So my great-grandfather adopted her and her son and allowed them to use the family name and declared to the family, she is now one of my daughters. And in all of the family photos here, when she appears, she is in the seat of honor. 
She is not a second-class daughter who stands at the corner to receive some crumbs under the table. No. She received the right to use the family name, and in all of the photos, she is in the prominent seat. Okay? So that is a wonderful story. But that, for me, captures what adoption is. She had no hope. She was a young, unwed mother. Father had run away and left her with a son. No education, no trade, nothing. No way to live other than to beg on the street. But in that story, there was a benevolent person who said, come into my home. And not only come into my home and I'll give you work and feed the chickens and you can clean the cars and, and mow the lawn. No. You come in and you be my daughter. And your son will be my grandson. So this character, his name was Krishna. He was Krishna Lim. And he will proudly declare him just to hear him and you meet someone and say, what's your name? And they go, Krishna Lim. Because that would be so unusual for an Indian gentleman to have a Chinese name. But he was proud of it. He was proud of it. He was proud to tell the story of his inheritance, of his place in this family. And that sums up for me this process of adoption, it gives us the right to become children of God. Okay? And what is the result of that adoption? We gain the same fellowship that Christ has with the Father. We are not separated by the veil. When Christ, what were his last words? It is finished. It is finished. And what happened when he said that? The veil in the temple was rent miraculously, supernaturally. There wasn't a guy waiting there with a dagger and, and they didn't have communications. Okay, he's gone, rip the veil now. Oh, that's in a Leslie City movie. It, that wasn't it. It was an act of God, a divine supernatural act of God to declare what Christ had fulfilled. It is finished and the veil was rent because the barrier between creation and creator is no more. You can now come into the Holy of Holies, climb into my lap, lean against my bosom and let me embrace you anytime you want. I will never be too busy for you. In fact, I'm looking out for you. Every moment of, of the day, I'm looking out for you. You know, when you sleep, when you wake, I know how many hairs have fallen from your head. What, is, what kind of example is that? <laughs> this is who Jesus came to reveal. You know how close attention your father is paying? He's watching over you, that he knows when a hair falls from your head. Oh, that is such a remarkable example. You don't even know when a hair falls from your head. And then we wonder when we have concerns for, for our future, for our health, for our children, for our jobs, for our schools, for whatever. We wonder, does God hear me? Does God care? I say, how must that hurt the heart of Baba? I can just feel God saying, why do you even think that, my child? You think that I don't care? You think I'm too busy? You really think I don't know? I know far more everything and every molecule that is moving in your being. I know when a hair falls from your head, please don't tell me that I may not care. Maybe we need confession. 
when we have not dismissed. The time to confess how we have not fully understood the magnitude, the depth, the intensity of God's love for us. And we will need to reject the condemnation of the devil and receive afresh all of the privileges and the rights of this adoption. So we gain the same fellowship. Jesus said, the Father and I are one. We gain the same inheritance as Christ. Galatians 4, it says, because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who called out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. Since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children and we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his suffering, we may also share in his glory. I'm going to close with this illustration that John Newton shared. You know John Newton? The one who wrote Amazing Grace. Slave trader who was transformed by his adoption from depravity to glory. And he tells this story of a man who had received notice. Apparently it was a true story. He had received notice of a large inheritance that had come his way. And he had to go to London to the lawyer's offices in order to sign off and receive that inheritance. And way back then, in the day of John Newton, that inheritance was one million pounds. So I don't know what that is in today's terms, but let's say it's possibly closer to a billion dollars. So this gentleman receives a letter and says, would we all like to receive a letter like that? We go back tomorrow morning, we open the we say, somehow this has come about. You have inherited a billion dollars. If you just go down into Bangkok and you sign the papers, it will be yours. So he's in this carriage making his way to London. About an hour from London, a wheel comes off his carriage and can go no further. And he has to walk to London. But as the story goes, people who later heard about his inheritance reported that along the way, he was complaining. When people say, where are you going? He's going to London, but you know, my carriage broke down. They didn't give me a proper carriage. And, and I told you, you know, I'm so tired. I can't walk properly. And so Newton used this as an example, as an illustration. He says, do you realize the inheritance you have coming your way? Your inheritance, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, and mind has not conceived. Besides the sum, I think there is no height and breadth to our inheritance. And yet, in this time, of our journey that is remaining before we receive that inheritance, what do people hear? We are complaining and lamenting of our struggles. Isn't that tragic? Isn't that sad? No, oh, if we turn to scripture, then let the reality of scripture convict your heart. And in the remainder of your days, receive this adoption and resolve to live the remainder of your journey with joy and anticipation. And let the bystanders hear psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs from your breath and not complaints and laments. Right? What is going to bring people into the kingdom? 
It is our joy in the midst of a suffering world. Not indifferent joy. It is a joy that comes in embracing and knowing and having the knowledge and the assurance of a treasure that both the trust cannot destroy. That life and death and nothing in all of creation can ever take away from us. I wish you joy. I wish you Jesus. We are brothers and sisters. Let us embrace this and journey together. Let us pray. Abba. Abba. Thank you for your matchless love. An undeserved and unending love. As I said, perhaps we take a moment to confess to you a lack of understanding of what our adoption means. For the times we have hurt you without doubt. And our dissatisfaction. Create in us a clean heart, O oh God. Today we ask this in the name of the one who paid the price to make it possible. Create in us clean hearts. Restore to us that joy, that first love of our salvation. Help us to embrace and live out the fullness of the price you have paid for each one of us. Regardless of our circumstances, our health, our anxieties, I ask now a special dispensation of your joy. May your spirit of adoption bring joy to all of our hearts. Lift the burdens that we have come here with. Let us lay it at the foot of your cross. We don't know what tomorrow may bring, but we know who brings tomorrow. It is Abba, our Father, who brings tomorrow. We who are evil know how to give good gifts to our children. How much more so our Abba who is in heaven. So we receive this afresh, Lord Jesus. May your spirit prompt us in every moment that we are inclined to doubt or complain or be discouraged. Lift our spirits and say, you are a child of God because he has adopted you. And by that you receive all of the rights and the inheritance to be children of God. Hallelujah. And amen. Thank you. Would you stand for me to pronounce a benediction? Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Abba, the fellowship, the process of adoption, the joy of the Holy Spirit be upon each of you as you go forth to be his children now and until his coming again. May be seated. Well, uh, our service is over. And thank you for being with us. Uh, we welcome you to be back with us next Sunday. Uh, we will, I first put this recording on, on uh, and I'll see how to incorporate the passages in, in that framework. Thank you. God bless. Have a great, happy, joyful week.